welcome to Beer and Iron's Chicken Pot Pie Recipe in a Cast Iron Camp Dutch Oven. It sure enough is a beautiful day for some camp cooking out in God's creation. A bit on the warm side, but we ain't complaining. We're going to take some beer brined and tenderized chicken breast, a bit of potato and vegetables, and create a stew-like recipe. And on top, we're going to crust it with some homemade buttermilk biscuits. You're thinking this may is going to be a hard recipe. Nope, not at all. We're going to have dinner ready in no time. Now get your deep 12-inch cast iron Camp Dutch oven out and let's get started. First, let's cover the ingredients. We have four skinless, boneless chicken breasts that we've already brined and tenderized in that bag. We did this part at home. Though tenderizing and brining the chicken breast is optional, it's definitely suggested. We have a second cutting board for our meat ingredients. Bacon. We need some cooking oil, and I'm gonna get my cooking oil from this bacon. On the way to camp, I stopped and picked up some thick cut bacon, about a half pound of this magic ingredient. If you have some regular cut bacon at home that is on the fatty side, this is a great way to use it up. You could skip the bacon and use a few tablespoons of oil, but that bacon is my suggestion. You're gonna need two 10 ounce cans, give or take an ounce or two, depending on what your local market has, of cream of chicken soup four medium russet potatoes, one large onion, some garlic. You're gonna need about 20 ounces, give or take, of some frozen vegetables, mixed vegetables. Leave these vegetables out to get to room or rather outdoor temperature. Let them start thawing out in other words. A couple or three tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce. Use this to taste. Add about a tablespoon of poultry seasoning. And it's completely optional, but a bit of sage really brings this recipe home. And maybe a bit of pepper. Heck y'all, add some other seasonings if you want. Beer. Definitely have a bit of beer on hand. Nope, we're not going to measure this beer. We're just going to keep it on hand and ready in case we need to use it later in the cook. And doggone it if I almost forgot to mention the evaporated milk. About a half cup will do the trick. Just bring a small five ounce can with you to camp and call it good. The biscuits, in other words, the crust. Here I have all the dry ingredients already mixed up and the butter cut into my flour mixture. Homemade biscuits are the way to go with this recipe. My basic buttermilk biscuit recipe calls for two cups of white flour, a tablespoon of baking powder, a teaspoon of baking soda, a teaspoon of salt, and then I cut eight tablespoons of butter into that dry mixture. You could mix all this in camp, or you could pre-mix it at home. I just mixed all this up at home. And don't forget the buttermilk. You'll need about a cup. Bring a bit more buttermilk, just in case. Let's talk Dutch ovens. This recipe can be created in any Dutch oven, but you'll need to modify the amount of ingredients depending on the size you're using. This recipe is presented by using a large 12-inch deep cast iron Dutch oven. This is an eight quart cast iron Dutch oven. This is a lodge 12 inch regular Dutch oven. It's a six quart. Neither one is better than the other, but we need to consider our biscuit crust at the top of this recipe. We'll need some space at the top to let the biscuits rise and still have enough air space above the rising biscuits so they don't hit the bottom of the lid. We're gonna go with the 12 inch deep cast iron Dutch oven today. Some Dutch ovens have a deeper lid that allows for more head space. Those will work very well with this recipe. Let's prepare the ingredients. Most of the ingredients do not need any preparation. They will just be an open and dump step. Some will need cutting and prepping. We're gonna start with the chicken and the bacon. Have a bowl or another container that can be covered nearby to put the chicken and the bacon lardons. What the heck is a lardon? We're working outside and there's two hazards out here, bugs and dropping our ingredients in the dirt. We're using a separate red cutting board for cutting the meat. Any color will do, but red reminds us that we've been using it for meat. Now grab yourself a beer. This IPA from Wallace Brewing is called the Vindicator. It's named after a mine in the Silver Valley of Idaho. It's brewed with malted barley grown in Idaho along with Pacific Northwest grown hops. We pack our tenderized and pre-brined chicken breast to camp. The pre-salted chicken will definitely add to both the flavor and the salt of this recipe. It's one of the reasons, along with the cream of chicken soups, that we don't add any salt to this recipe today. Notice the paper towel I'm pulling off the chicken meat. 
That works kind of like the pad from the packaging from the butcher or meat market. We're going to brown our chicken first, sear it in other words, and I want to make sure it's dry but not too dry. First, cut the chicken into strips. Then cut the strips into big bite-sized portions. Save the chicken in the container until you're ready to use it later. Here's a different angle on how I cut the chicken. First in strips, and then into larger, big bite-sized pieces. Cover your chicken so the bugs won't find it and keep the container near. We'll be storing our bacon lardons in the same container. What's a lardon? Basically, a lardon is a small strip or cube of fatty bacon or pork fat. We're going to be cutting this bacon into smaller stick-like cuts and use the rendered fat from these lardons or little cubes of fatty bacon to both sear our chicken and saute our onions and garlic. These will remain in our recipe and deliver a few flavor bombs along their way. You could use regular thin cut bacon and the end result will be delicious as well. And if pork is not part of your diet preferences, feel free to use any oil of your choice. Just store the bacon in the same container as the chicken, but don't mix it in with the chicken. Keep the chicken and bacon kind of separated so you can grab what you need when you need it. If you're enjoying this video thus far, consider giving us a thumbs up, hitting that subscribe button, and give a little ding on that dinner bell. Now for the other ingredients. We're going to cut the potatoes first. An optional step is to have a container for water to keep the cut potatoes in until you need them. I like to use a container with a lid so the flies and gnats don't end up going swimming in my potatoes on this hot day. Using a knife, different from the one we use to cut meat, we're going to cube up our potatoes into smaller bite-sized pieces. Keep the container of water nearby to put the cut pieces of potatoes. We may or may not use all these potatoes, and I'll explain why in a bit. Any leftover potatoes can be skilleted up in the morning for breakfast, if there are any leftovers. Now for the onion. Finally chop one large onion. Store the chopped onion in another container. I'm just using a zipper bag. We'll store the garlic and onions in the same bag to saute them later at the same time. Break the garlic apart and use as many of the garlic cloves as you like. On some of the larger garlic cloves, I tend to cut off the root end. When it's too thick, it may end up as an unexpected crunch while we enjoy our meal. Charcoal. There's a debate about charcoal in camp cast iron Dutch oven cooking, but we ain't gonna debate. You can use charcoal or you can use coals from a wood fire. It's up to you. What we do is we take a brand called Matchlight and we use that to light our natural briquettes. I find that the natural briquettes are larger, burn longer, but cook at the same rate as the smaller ones, but they just last longer. Basically, they put off about the same temperature for longer. So why use both? The match light does what it promises, lights with a match. I'd have to use another form of fuel to get that hardwood briquette to fire. Using match light first, just a few, and topping the match light with the hardwood briquettes, it's going to help get those hardwood briquettes to fire up. You'll let your briquettes burn a bit and get that nice coat of white ash. Just let them heat up until the flame has reduced or there's no longer a flame. Then you'll know you're ready. The ones on the bottom will burn hotter and faster. Sometimes you'll need to stir them up, but be careful on really hot, dry days. That wave of sparks right there can cause a big problem in the forest. We're going to first fry and then we're going to bake this recipe. So we need more than just 24 plus briquettes under that cast iron Dutch oven. We want a hot, hot surface to sear our meat and saute our onions and garlic. After we have seared our chicken and sauteed our onions and garlic, we're going to bake this recipe and we'll need to heat the camp cast iron Dutch oven accordingly. There's a link on a detailed how-to regarding heating the camp cast iron Dutch oven in the description below. I often use wooden utensils when I'm cooking with cast iron. And a little camp table that's shorter to the ground is sure handy, I tell you what. Gather your ingredients. We're going to start by browning or searing the chicken. An optional step is to add flour to the chicken just a bit before you start to sear the chicken. Flouring the chicken is completely optional. Add the bacon and let the bacon sear and give up that oil flavor. Save some of the bacon for later. You'll need less bacon grease for the onions and garlic than you do to sear the chicken. You'll see the bacon start to brown and the oil will start to flow. 
we're about to add our chicken. Remember as you cook this that nothing has to be cooked to doneness at this point. Some underdone bacon and underdone chicken is okay for now. Add about half the chicken. We don't want to overwhelm our pot and lose the heat. As soon as that chicken hits that pot, it will fight with that pot. The pot will try to heat the chicken and the chicken's going to try to cool the pot. Cook the chicken in two to three batches to make sure you get a good sear. That chicken has moisture and we really need it to steam off as it sears. Just leave the bacon in there with the chicken. You see I have a second Dutch oven nearby. That's what we're going to store the chicken in between batches. You could add a paper towel to that second Dutch oven to soak up any excess oil or moisture. Keep in mind that that second Dutch oven does not have any heat to it and it's just there to hold the chicken for now. Do you see me moving the chicken over to one side of the pot? Most Dutch ovens lean a bit on unlevel ground. I'm moving the chicken uphill to reserve some of the oil for the next batch of chicken. You can add oil if you need to for that second batch. Sear up the second batch of chicken. Once the second batch is done, move it over with the first batch of chicken. Leave all those bits and pieces in that Dutch oven. If you need more oil for sauteing the onions and garlic, add more bacon or a little bit of oil to the pot. Once the new fat or oil is hot and ready, add the onions and the garlic at the same time. If things aren't progressing quickly enough, add a few tablespoons of beer to start the steam and help the onions and garlic do the same. Once the garlic and the onions are ready, return the chicken to the pot. Now add the vegetables. And then the potatoes. But wait, only add a few potatoes at a time. We have other ingredients and want to make sure we don't run out of room. We can always add more potatoes later, but fishing them dudes out is not so easy. Add both cans of cream of chicken soup, and then add the evaporated milk. Add the couple or three tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce. Add this to taste. And then do a rough measured tablespoon of poultry seasoning. Add other seasonings if you want to. I have some rub sage and some ground pepper here. And of course, salt to taste. I have beer brine chicken meat and the salt from the soups and Worcestershire sauce here. I think we're good to go on the salt. Now what about the beer? Not yet, hang on. Now mix everything up really well and smooth it out. If you feel you have any room for held out ingredients like some of those potatoes, throw them into the pot. Mix it all in well. Remember, we're not making soup. This is more like a thick stew. Think baked potato. There's moisture in those potatoes and vegetables as well as those other ingredients. We want it thick, but we don't want it too thick. And if it is too thick, you can add a little beer to thin things out a bit. There's still a lot of heat under that pot, and that mixture is going to start to bubble very quickly. Make sure everything is smoothed out on top. Don't add the biscuits just yet. Hang on. We're going to judge the time for when we add the biscuits by the consistency of the cooked potatoes. We may have underdone bacon and chicken in that pot right now. The time and cooking temperature that is required to cook the potatoes to doneness will also finish off that chicken and bacon. Pork or bacon is considered done at 145 degrees Fahrenheit or 63 degrees Celsius. Chicken is considered done at 165 degrees Fahrenheit or 74 degrees Celsius. Cook accordingly. Once everything is smoothed out on top, return the lid to the pot and remove the pot from the fire for now. Notice how big those briquettes still are. I love those briquettes. We're going to bake this dish at about 350 degrees Fahrenheit or 175 degrees Celsius. It's a 12 inch pot. To heat this pot to 350 degrees Fahrenheit or 175 degrees Celsius, we need about 24 to 26 briquettes or more if they burn down during searing and sauteing. My formula is to take the diameter of the Dutch oven and multiply that number times two. We have a 12 inch Dutch oven times two is 24. And then we divide that number by three. 24 divided by three is eight. Place eight or nine briquettes under the oven and the rest, about 16 to 18 briquettes on the top. It's an imperfect science. My formula is a guide only and not written in stone. You'll get the feel for it. Now get you another beer. After the dish has been cooking for about 15 minutes or so, 
Check and see how things are going. Yes, that's looking perfect. Give everything a bit of a stir and then smooth things out on the top. Return the lid and give everything a turn. What do you mean give it a turn? Turn the lid one third in one direction and then turn the whole pot one third in the other direction. After 15 more minutes have gone by, give it a look-see. Use a fork and pull out one of the bigger potato pieces. The potatoes are gonna be our timer of sorts in this recipe. Once the potatoes are done, or very close to being done, it's time for the biscuits. Our biscuit ingredients are all mixed up in this zipper bag. They've been kept cold in the ice chest. Remember, there's cold butter cut into that flour, soda, powder, and salt mixture. We have to keep it cold. Pour the contents into a bowl. Using from the ice chest cold buttermilk, pour about one cup with the dry ingredients. Mix it about. Add more buttermilk if you need to. Just remember, it's easier to add buttermilk later than to remove the buttermilk. Once the mixture is a bit sticky and gooey, not like bread dough, Flour the surface with about one half cup of flour. Pour the sticky biscuit dough onto the floured surface. Dust the top of the dough with some more flour. Now don't knead the dough like bread. Just flatten it out and then fold it over a few times. Smooth and round it out. Make the dough flatter than you would be if you were making biscuits for breakfast. We're really making a very thick pot pie crust in a manner of speaking. You could just put that whole rounded piece of dough on top of that pot pie mixture, but cutting the serving size sections is very helpful. The biscuit cutter is optional, but add a bit of flour to whatever you're cutting the dough with. Cut them any which way you want to. They don't have to be Pinterest perfect and round. Make a few Pac-Man shaped biscuits. We'll puzzle them all together in a bit. Take the bits and parts and hand make the last biscuit. By the end, see if you can tell which biscuit is the handmade biscuit. At this point, our pot pie mixture is cooked and it is wicked hot. Basically, the hot mixture is gonna heat our biscuits from underneath and the top of the biscuits will cook and toast from the heat we put on the lid. Remove all the heat from the bottom of the Dutch oven. We have a few new briquettes burning there and at the ready. See, that pot is still hot and the mixture is still bubbling. Add the raw biscuits to the top of the mixture and puzzle them together. Pack them in tight. And if you run out of room, just shove one in sideways. Return the lid to the pot. At home, I'd cook my biscuits at about 400 to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. So load that lid up with a bunch of hot briquettes. Not like a buffet plate loaded, but loaded nonetheless. An optional step is to coat the biscuits with a bit of scrambled egg about halfway from when the biscuits are being done. Just rest the lid on a nearby stand and baste the biscuits tops with that scrambled egg. Be sure to turn the lid a bit more often during the biscuit bake part. Okay, moment of truth. Are you ready? Now, look at that. We're high society now, I tell you what. Bring in your bowls and let's serve it up. I like to put some britches on my serving bowls. This stuff is hot. And when I say britches, I mean those covers we found over on that Etsy site. And don't forget your wooden serving spoon. I ain't ever gone to cook and remembered everything I need. If you've enjoyed this video and have learned something new today, consider a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and don't forget to hit that little dinner bell. And that's it, y'all. We're gonna empty that pot and fill our bellies with that goodness. And then we're going to go out and do some photography of the beauty that's all around us in the great outdoors. Y'all enjoy this recipe. Give it a try and let me know how it turns out.
My name is Sue Lay, and I love to share the magic that comes out of my black pots and pans. Y'all keep on cooking in those black and enameled beauties and keep on enjoying those frosted glasses of that fermented barley pop. We'll see you next time on BeerAndIron.com.